Good morning. <laughs> I am a creature of habit. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be here with you. It's a delightful day, isn't it? Um, I was saying earlier this morning that I've never met an October that I didn't like. And it seems that whether you live in Minnesota or Missouri or Mississippi, uh, October is a pleasant month. So it's a delight to gather here with you to worship. I want to remind you of a couple of things. The Preacher's Forum will convene tonight, and because of a quirk in the schedule, uh, we don't have a, a seminarian who will be coming in to preach. Yours truly will be preaching tonight. So if you ever wanted just to let me know what you really think, tonight is your chance. So... We will convene at 6.15 p.m. and you can excoriate me to your heart's delight. Uh, it's also, uh, I want to point you to the fact that there is a fold luncheon coming up in about two weeks from today. If you are a part of the McCoy or Roby folds, then there will be a fold luncheon directly after the service of worship two weeks from today. Also, a uh, men's ministry event, the second annual Cornhole Tournament and Barbecue is forthcoming, and you can sign up for that, register online at, uh, at the church website. Uh, but maybe most important is that uh, next, this coming weekend, next uh, Saturday and Sunday, is, is our fall uh, local missions conference. It's, it's upon us. We're going to be talking about what it means to labor faithfully in the Lord and, and look at well, how do we glorify God in the work that he's given us to do? Work itself is God-glorifying. God work itself precedes the fall into sin. Work has become toilsome, and now we labor by the sweat of our brows because of our sin. But work itself is a good gift that God has given to us, and there is redeeming value in work. And so we will have a church work day uh, this coming Saturday morning from 8.30 to noon right here in the church. Please register for it. You'll find a QR code on page 11 in your bulletin. You can also go online and register for that work day because we want to know how many people we have coming so that we can have plenty of donuts, we can have plenty of coffee, and we can divide people appropriately in work crews and know that we'll have enough people to man however many projects we have around the church. So register. Also register for the Sunday evening component next week of the missions conference because we'll be feeding you and we have to know how many people are coming so we can get the right amount of food. So please register. Today is the last day to register for these events. I keep saying the word register. That's intentional. Register. Also uh, joining us next Sunday morning will be Dan Doriani. He is a professor of uh, theology at Covenant Seminary. He's written and spoken extensively on work on the value of work and why we do what we do and how you can think about your vocation and the various avocations, that is, passions that you have outside of your paid labor. So please be praying for the Fall Missions Conference and say it with me, register. Thank you. All right. So we have come here to worship our Lord. And one of the things that we'll look at from the Bible later this morning is that Jesus supplies your every need. He, your Savior, supplies your every need. And with that in mind, take a moment to prepare to come to worship your Savior. I am trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, trusting all.
worship this morning comes from Psalm chapter 9, and Charles Spurgeon wrote this of Psalm 9, speaking of the writer, memories of the past and confidences concerning the future led the man of God to plead for the needs of the present. Memories of the past, confidences concerning the future led the man of God to plead for the needs of the present. That is the God who's calling us to worship this morning, who has provided for us in the past, who promises good for our future, and it's right that we come before him in the presence to sing his praises. So would you please stand as God calls us to worship from Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. The Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Take you you your hymnals and turn to hymn number 345 as we sing praises. Glorious things of thee are spoken. <laughs>
Our God and our Father, we are gathered this morning to give you thanks. Would you help us to do so with our whole heart? Will you bring to our minds your wonderful deeds? Will you gladden our hearts so that we would exult in you and sing praises to your name? Father, we praise you for the salvation you have worked through Christ in the past. Father, we are confident in your promise of eternal life for us. And so we come now on this day in the present to praise you for you sit enthroned in Zion. We ask that you would accomplish all of this by the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes words that ought to encourage every believer. He says, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the gist of it is, can you imagine somebody that you deem to be so righteous, some person that you deem to be so good, some person that you deem to be so valuable that you would willingly choose to sacrifice your own child so that that person could continue to live and positively to impact the world and, and to bless people with his or her righteousness? Can you imagine somebody so good that you would willingly sacrifice your child that that person would live? And Paul says, well, maybe. Maybe I could see that happening. But then he says this, you were sinful, not righteous. You were wicked, not good. And yet your heavenly Father sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. You are so valuable to him that he sent his son to, to lay down his life for you, not when you were righteous and worth saving, not when you were good and worth sacrificing his son for, but when you were a sinner. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing good news. It is encouraging good news. It is the gospel. And so I'd encourage you to take a moment to turn to God, to turn away from sin, to repent, and to believe anew this truth that Jesus has supplied your need and he has come to live and to die for you. Take a moment quietly in your own heart to pray. Heavenly Father, you loved us, not because we were good, but in spite of the fact that we were not. Father, you saved us not because we were righteous, but in order to make us righteous. Father, we thank you for loving us so much while we were still sinners that you sent Christ to die for us. We do pray that you would forgive us our sins. We pray that you would confirm in us a gratitude that wells up unto eternal life, a gratitude in our hearts that never ceases to, to give thanks to Christ for his work of salvation, never ceases to overflow in a life that is lived for the glory of the Son. Father, we, we thank you that you remind us in your word just how much you have loved us, and you remind us how we had a terrible a terrible need that we couldn't pay, but you sent Christ to supply our every need. We thank you, and it is in his name we pray. Amen. Paul continues, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Beloved, by your sins you were enemies of God, but now you are reconciled and saved, and you ought then not only to pray, but to sing with joy and with confidence as his beloved and saved people. So please stand with me and turn to page 5 in your bulletin as together we sing, No, not despairingly, I come to thee. As the ushers come forward, I would remind you to please complete the connection card that's in the bulletin, not only to register your attendance with us, but to submit any prayer requests that you would like the pastors, elders, and ministry staff to pray for in the coming weeks. It is our privilege to do so for you. And so now we come together as a congregation to pray to our Lord and hear these words from Psalm 86, verse 1. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, when we look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? 
Father, as your people, we praise you that you bend down to us and hear our prayers. We are on your mind and you know the details of our lives. You care for us, comfort us, provide for us, assure us that nothing can separate us from your love. For your love to your people is steadfast. You are faithful to keep your promises. Your word testifies that you did not turn your back on your people for their doubts, their hard hearts, their sin. But you remained slow to anger and gracious. And you accomplished the redemption of your people through the sacrifice of your own son. And we praise you that he, Jesus, supplies our every spiritual need. Father, in this life we remain weak and afflicted by our own sin and the sin of others. We are afflicted by the effects of sin in this world. So would you help us? Help us to put death to death our own sin. Help us to be patient with truth and love to the sins of others. Help us to notice the effects of sin in this world and point all to the grace of Christ. Father, many in Florida and on the East Coast have lost their earthly possessions. Would you provide for their physical needs? Hold back those who would take advantage of the vulnerable and to your people give opportunity for deeds of mercies. Bring to faith in Christ those who do not believe, so that they may say, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though its waters roar and foam. There is a city of God, and she shall not be moved. Father, we pray for next weekend's local missions conference. Prevent each one of us from only listening to the local ministries, but move us to participate in them. Bless the Saturday workday as we care for this property that you have provided and help each one of us in whatever we do to work heartily as for you and not for men. For indeed, we serve the Lord Christ. Father, your word says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So as we hear your word preached, work saving faith in those who do not believe in Christ and sanctify and deepen the faith of those who do. All for the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen. And speaking of the partnership of the Philippian church in his gospel ministry, Paul writes in Philippians 4.18 these words, I am well supplied, having received the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Amen.
It could, it could make sense for you to walk away from Christ. It could make sense for you to turn from him to some other savior, to some other religion, to some other pattern of thought. It could make sense if, if you could be shown that Christ is unable or unwilling to meet your need. If you could be shown that, then, then it, no one could blame you for looking elsewhere to find the Savior that you need. But what if the Scripture shows you that Christ meets your every need? Then you would have every reason to do exactly what Paul exhorts you to do today, which is to continue in the faith. Open with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This morning we'll be looking at verses 21 to 23. You can find that on page 983 of the Black Bible in the pew in front of you. Page 983. And I want you to recall that the Apostle Paul has taught that Jesus is both the Lord of the creation and he is the Lord of the church. He is fully God and fully man and he is the one who will reconcile all things. And today, today Paul talks to those of you who, who will receive that particular reconciliation that is proper to those who have been made holy and blameless and above reproach before God. That particular setting right of your relationship with God that belongs to you as redeemed people. That is that you will you will be eternally with him. That is the right relationship for you with the Lord. And so as Paul teaches the Colossians that Christ supplies their every need, he's teaching you also that Christ supplies your every need. Christ supplied your past need. You had a need in the past that Christ came and he addressed it. And Christ continues to supply your present need as well. Because we all continue to have needs and Christ supplies those. And since he supplies your every need, you, you have a firm foundation and a firm call from him to continue in the faith. And it's with that in mind that I'll read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, and as we read together, let's remember that this is God's holy word. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And beloved, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. And as Paul begins to show the believers at Colossae that that they possess no need that Christ fails to meet. He teaches them, firstly, that Christ has supplied their past need. Christ supplied your past need. And I want to begin by saying that these verses won't make sense if. So if you cannot see yourself as a sinner, then you'll never see your need for Jesus. I'll just say that up front. If you can't see yourself as a sinner, you'll never see your need for Jesus. And the word sinner is offensive in contemporary American culture. And what it leads to, if you tell somebody you're a sinner, what, what it leads to is that they become so offended by, beca- by being called a sinner that they're not considering how offensive they are as a sinner to a holy God. So you've got to get comfortable at some point along the way with that label because it's a biblical category. And if we don't become comfortable with it, then the Christianity that we proclaim is anemic and it is sinless and it's inoffensive and it's a false Christianity. And that's not the way of Paul. Rather, Paul was very direct in talking to people about their sin and need. And so he said, you, you people, you, I think that that's an under translation. It probably ought to be damned is me. He was pronouncing condemnation upon himself because he saw 
the holiness of God, and he saw that he himself, by virtue of comparison to the holiness of God, was in fact evil. And so God said, walk before me and be blameless. He didn't say, walk before me and be better than your next door neighbor. <laughs> and, but that's how we often think of evil. You know, other people did something evil. I did something not quite as bad, and so what I did can't be called evil. And then we start parsing evil instead of listening to what the Lord is, what the Lord is saying. What he says is, biblically, every failure on your part and mine to shun every unholy thought or word or motivation or attitude or action is evil. And every failure to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love you, my neighbor, as myself, considering you more valuable than myself, putting you ahead of myself, every time I fail to do that, I am engaging in evil. And so when we begin to understand just how how pervasive sin is in us, it leads to this idea that, wow, I really have a ter tremendous need. I have a tremendous need. Remember, Jesus is supplying needs. Listen, how, listen to how Jesus describes it in Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners. You have, to, you have to be willing to say, that's me. I'm a sinner. I'm one of those that Jesus is calling to repentance. I self-identify as sick in need of a physician, as a sinner in need of a Savior. And it goes to this. If you have, if you have $5 worth of sin, you've got a $5 Savior. And he isn't worth much. But if you can acknowledge, I am alienated from my God. I am hostile in mind, and my deeds are evil. Then you have an eternal Savior who has paid your mountainous debt before a holy God. And that's why verse 22 says that Jesus has reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death. He's reconciled you who believe. How? In his body by his death. Jesus is a real man. He had, has a real human body, really crucified for you, really rose bodily from the dead, really did these things to deal with and pay for your evil deeds and mind. And so what that, what that means and what Paul is getting at with these Colossians, he's just reminding them. He's, he's saying you had this need in the past. You had it. It was real. It's not less real for being a spiritual need. It's maybe more real for being spiritual and, and not just something temporary like the need for food or the need for water or the need for shelter or the need for clothing. You had a need. You, are, you were desperately sick and Jesus took your disease to heal you. You were desperately in debt, and he took your debt upon himself and paid for it. You were desperately guilty, and he accepted the punishment for your guilt and died for it. In short, he died for your sin to reconcile you to God. And remember, that word reconcile means, means at its most basic, to establish a proper relationship between two parties. And in this case, it's the proper relationship between those whom he has made blameless and a holy God. And he's done this in order to do what? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach. I, I'm, th that, that phrase, to present you, uh, you could render that to cause you to be holy and blameless and above reproach. He has, he has caused you to be these things. By his death for you, he causes you to be accepted by God as holy and blameless and above reproach. And just think about that. How I would rejoice. I would rejoice if Paul simply said, he has caused you to be holy before God. Like, woohoo! Or he has caused you to be seen as blameless before God. Amen! Or he has caused you to be seen as above reproach before God. Hallelujah! But he has caused you to be what? It's not, not just holy, not just blameless, not just above reproach, but holy and blameless and above reproach. He has triple cleaned you. Isn't that amazing? 
What, what an incredible gift that he has done. He, he's triple cleaned you. And he's presented you this way, who? Before him. That is, before the face of God. Before him, in front of him, in his sight, in his eyes. It's not just that he's come to you and said, Oh, uh, you're holy and you're blameless and you're above reproach before me, Paul, the apostle. No, 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 no. No, you are these things before the face of God, the Holy One. That's how He sees you. And, and Paul is reminding the Colossians of this, saying, you are, you are triple clean because you trust in Jesus. You are holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight of God. Your need was great. Your need was enormous. Your need was insurmountable. But Christ's supply of your need went beyond your need, far beyond it. So much so that by addressing your past need, he has guaranteed your future status before God. Both have been taken care of. And so Paul says, Christ supplied your past need. Now you know that because we even sing about it. You, you've probably sung Amazing Grace a thousand times in your life, and you know what it says. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. In other words, I needed to be found, and Christ found me. I needed to see, and Christ gave me sight. Now my need is past, for Christ supplied for my need. And we sing about it. We sing joyfully. We re rejoice over it. So I want to ask you, can you speak of your alienation from God as a past thing? Do you know it's past for you because you trust in Christ? Have you looked at Christ's supply and said, he did that for me, me personally? He did it for me. He knew my name when he died for me. I, I, in the sight of God, am holy and blameless and above reproach because that's what Christ has done for me. Can you speak of your alienation from God as past tense? Can you describe your hostility in mind toward God as a thing of the past? I once thought this way, and my mind ran toward all kinds of sin and rebellion, but now my mind runs toward how can I glorify the Lord in everything I do? How can I glorify the Lord in my work? How can I glorify the Lord in my speech? How can I glorify the Lord in my family? Is that how your mind now runs because your hostility of mind is a thing of the past. Can you describe your evil deeds as in the past, as crucified with Christ? That's not to say that you're perfect now. None of us will be perfect until glory. But it used to be that your deeds were evil because they were consistent with your character. And it was inconsistent for you to, to engage in righteousness. And now your deeds are righteous because they're consistent with your character. And it's inconsistent for you to go back and behave like the old man. Because the old man is dead and buried, having been crucified with Christ. Can you, can you say that you are now reconciled, not by your effort and not by your goodness and not by your church attendance and not by your virtues, that you are reconciled by the death of Christ for you in whom you believe who you own by faith. Can you say that? Is that the confession of your heart? And do you know that you stand triple clean before the face of God because your Savior has made you that way? In short, do you know by faith that Jesus and only Jesus, without help from you, supplied your need? If you don't trust Jesus, your need remains. Listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 5. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gives us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
Can you say, along with the, the Heidelberg Catechism, Heidelberg Catechism asks, what is true faith? And part of its answer is that it is a wholehearted trust, which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel, that God has freely granted, not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These gifts are purely of grace only because of Christ's merit. Can you say it? Is that the confession of your mouth? Can you say that from your heart? Is that your conviction? Then if it is, then Jesus has supplied your need. If you cannot, then your need remains. Therefore, I exhort you this day to, to turn and trust in Jesus to ask him to give you the gift of faith, to ask him to supply your need and cause you also to stand triple clean before your holy God. If you've never done so before, it's a simple prayer. Pray this. Jesus, do all this for me. Amen. And if you then know that Jesus has supplied your past need then it makes sense what Paul continues to say because he doesn't just say Jesus has supplied your past need, but he says also that Jesus supplies your present need. He supplies your present need, and he teaches this by, by inserting this word that sometimes we find difficult at the beginning of verse 23, if. All these things are true of you, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. All these things are true of you if, if what? If you continue in the faith. So what is your present need? Your present need is to continue in the faith. You need to continue trusting the things that you trusted at the beginning. You need to continue to believe that Christ is the supply for you. The faith that, just, that is just described, faith in Christ, which Jude calls the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You need to hang on to this and continue in this faith, stable, which means established and steadfast, not shifting. You could say not ceasing from what? From the hope of the gospel. And again, hope in America is I hope I wake up tomorrow morning having won the lottery and I have x-ray vision. That's hope in America. We use it that way. Hope in the scripture is described as the anchor of the soul. It is a profound and settled confidence in the work of Christ on your behalf. It's, it's confidence that the good news is telling you the true story that Jesus, in fact, saves sinners. Paul even says, sinners of whom I am chief or of whom I am the foremost. And that same message is being proclaimed all over the world. It's being proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul already says that it's bearing fruit everywhere. Everywhere this goes, everywhere this message is proclaimed, this, this thing happens, and you can actually see it's happening. People's lives are miraculously, supernaturally transformed and changed. And you can't explain it. You can't explain it by virtue of the words that the preacher speaks. You can only explain it by virtue of the fact that God is working through the words to save people. And it's happening all over the world. This is, this is what Paul is teaching them. And the context, and we've talked about this very briefly, but the Colossians are facing some kind of false teaching, and we'll talk more about that in sermons to come. In some way, shape, or form, they're being taught that they need Jesus plus something else, or they need some, something other than Jesus. But Paul has already taught that Jesus is not one option among many. Rather, he alone saves. You have choices in salvation. You have Jesus, Jesus, or Jesus. And so... What Paul says is, if, if you reject Jesus, you reject your own salvation. And you say, Pastor, does this mean that somebody can be saved and then later lose their salvation? No, I don't think that's what Paul is saying. Because salvation is God's work, and when he saves you, he saves you. But rather, Paul is, Paul is not guessing the elect among the church at Colossae, he is simply stating a fact. Y your perseverance in faith in Christ does not produce your salvation. But your perseverance in faith in Christ proves that you have been saved. 
It proves that you have been rescued. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about that last week. If you're under rubble, under a building that has collapsed upon you, you just get rescued. You're completely passive in it. You get rescued by the person who comes to rescue you. And so if you trust in Christ, you get rescued. And every church needs to hear the gospel. And every church needs to hear the consequences of turning away from or rejecting the gospel when it is preached to you. Why? Because every church is a mixed bag of believers and unbelievers, of those who are strong and those who are weak. It's a mixed bag of wheat and of tares. And so Paul is saying, all these things are true of you. But what he doesn't want to say and what I don't want to say is all these things are automatically true of you by virtue of you sitting in a Christian church. That's not what saves you. All these things are true. Jesus did all these things for those who repent and trust in him. And if the if describes you and you are not stable in that conviction, if the if describes you and you're one who's chasing after other gods, then the things that Jesus did don't apply to you. And Paul doesn't want them to be deceived that simply being a part of a group of people who are sitting in a church building is sufficient. He doesn't want that. And so he has to say, if... Because they have this great and present need, and the present need is to continue in the faith. And Jesus meets that need. And I want you to see that Jesus meets that need in a very particular way in these verses. There are places in the Bible where you could say, okay, you have the present need to continue in the faith, and so what has Jesus done? Well, you could say he's given you the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit indwells you, and the Holy Spirit convicts you, and the Holy Spirit helps you understand the Word, and it's the Holy Spirit who helps you continue in the faith. But that's not what Paul says here. He says it elsewhere. He also says elsewhere, okay, well, you could say, how, why do we continue in the faith? Well, because there's this unbreakable chain of salvation that Paul talks about in Romans that talks about the foreordination of people. And if you're foreordained, then you're justified. And if you're justified, then you're glorified. And it's all linked together in this unbreakable chain. You could say that, but he doesn't say that. In this passage, Jesus meets the present need of the Colossians in a different way. Look, he says that they need to continue in the faith. And that this faith is proclaimed in all creation and of which I, Paul, became a minister. How does, how does God meet the present need of the Colossians? He gives them a sinful man to tell them holy things. He sends them a faithful minister who will remind them of the truth when they need to be reminded who will exhort them to continue trusting in Jesus because life is hard, who will encourage them not to step away from the confidence they had at the beginning because the world is miserable and it hurts and sometimes you don't understand. Do you see that? That Paul is a minister of whom Jesus and of what? The gospel. You have a present need. The present need is to continue in the faith that is once for all delivered to you, not to shift from Christ, but to ground your hope, your confidence in him. And Jesus meets that present need by sending you, by sending you men who will minister the gospel to you and who will exhort you not to shift from it. See, Christ supplies not only your past need, Christ supplies your present need. Years ago, uh, I was in a different church. I was preaching and seeing little fruit. I was praying. Uh, I was not seeing God move. And I was lamenting to a fellow pastor about those problems. And I remember saying to him, I just don't know what to do. And his reply has stuck with me. He said, keep preaching. Keep praying. Keep trusting. And he was Christ's minister to me in that moment that I might continue in the faith. Now, there's no way that you're going to walk through this life without facing temptation. Anybody here never face temptation? There's no way you're going to walk through this life without, without experiencing doubt. Anyone here never have a doubt, ever? I'm glad you're not raising your hand. I would need to rebuke you publicly. Okay? <laughs> Anyone here ever walk throughout life without temporarily forgetting the anchor of your soul that you possess in Christ? You ever walk through life without getting bruised and battered? Whew. 
You walk through life and you spend six days and 23 hours out of every week with the world telling you all the things that are antagonistic to what the scripture tells you about who you are in Christ. It's hard not to believe it sometimes, isn't it? But Jesus knows this. He knows that you have a profound need and he offers a profound comfort. He sees your present need for reassurance. He sees that you need strength to continue in the faith. And one of the ways that he provides it is through your fellow servants. When the scripture says that, that Paul is a, a minister of Christ, the word is literally servant. And his was a particular office. He was a minister. He was an apostle. He was a, a pastor, you could say. But you need not be a pastor to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage and to continue in the faith. So I want to ask you, do you see yourself as a minister to your fellow believers? I think if you do, one of the things you're going to do is exhort them and encourage them. You're going to speak the scripture to them. You're going to come alongside them in their time of need. You'll be strong when they're weak, knowing that at some point in the future, they'll be strong when you're weak, do you see their well-being, their spiritual well-being as your responsibility? It's not just my responsibility. It's not just David's responsibility. If the two of us had to take responsibility for the spiritual well-being of the 400 of you, <laughs> we would only and always fail miserably. You need to care for each other. You need to be responsible for each other. Do you understand that you can be Christ's instrument to supply their present need? You, that your words can carry his comfort and support directly to them at the moment that they need it. A word that is, that is well chosen, that is fitly spoken at a time of need. And so I say to you, I stand before you and I say to you, Christ died for you. Christ triple cleansed you. Christ will take you to be with him and with God forever. But will you commit to say that to each other also? Does it need to be me who says it all the time? And I know that so many of you are. You're saying those things. You're exhorting each other. You're encouraging each other. You're praying for and with each other. You're giving each other the word of God. You're, you're standing firm in Christ Jesus. Keep doing that. Keep, keep exhorting one another because you, you are a minister. And... Today, I would exhort you, go find a brother or sister today. Maybe somebody that you can turn to in the pews. Maybe after the service of worship and say to them, brother, continue in the faith. Sister, Christ has reconciled you to God. Friend, through Christ Jesus, you are triple cleansed. To stand before your God, holy and blameless and above reproach, say to one another, do not shift from the anchor of the gospel. Because when you say such things, you serve as Christ's instrument to supply the present needs of your siblings in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? So minister to one another. Because the truth is, if Christ did not supply your every need, then it might make sense for you to walk away from the faith. But Christ has supplied your past need. He has saved you and guaranteed that you will stand before your Father for all eternity, triple clean in his sight. And Christ supplies your present need, not only by sending the Holy Spirit to you, not only by teaching you about the unbreakable chain of salvation, but he supplies your present need by grafting you into a body of Christ where you have brothers and sisters who will minister to you. So you continue in the faith. Continue stable and steadfast. Continue not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Continue confident in Christ. Please pray with me. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and we thank you for the cleansing that we have in him that even now because of his death and burial and resurrection and ascension, his life and death on our behalf, we stand before you clean holy and blameless and above reproach before you. 
Father, help us to say such things to one another, to, to remind one another so that each of us would be strong to continue in the faith, not shifting from the foundation that we have in Christ Jesus. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, will you stand as we sing together number 504, I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. Here at the Lord's table, you have a physical picture, physical picture of how Christ is about the business of supplying your every need, even your present need, your need for continuing in the faith, because it is difficult. Life is hard. The world is antagonistic. You battle your own flesh. You battle the messages the world sends you. It's hard, and you need strength to continue in the faith. Uh, Paul tells us elsewhere that our that our afflictions in the grand scheme of things are light and momentary. How many of you have ever read that and thought, they don't feel light and they don't feel momentary? I've been battling the same struggles and pains and trials for decades. They don't feel momentary. Well, here's a place where you can be reminded that though, though you face those trials and though they hurt, and though those struggles can be intense, before your God, you are blameless and holy and above reproach. And here is where you can be strengthened to continue in the faith. As we approach this table, we're approaching a spiritual meal. And in the same way that bread and wine nourish the body, so the body and blood of Jesus nourish and feed and strengthen the soul. And so I want to remind you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For wherever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
And so this table is for believers. It's for those of you who can confess and who own in your heart that Jesus did all these things for you. Your trust is firmly grounded in him. And I'm not saying that you trust without ever a doubt. That's not the bar for this table. But if your confidence is in Christ Jesus, then you are welcome to come to this table. If you publicly profess that he is your Lord and Savior and you own what he did for you, come to this table. It is the place to come when you are doubting. It is the place to come when you are hurting. It is the place to come when you don't understand. And he will strengthen you that you might continue in your faith. But the Apostle Paul does add words of warning. He says that if a man does not, doesn't, doesn't examine himself, nobody who examines him, doesn't, fails to examine himself, can come to the Lord's table. Because if you do that, if you approach without discerning the body and blood of the Lord, that is recognizing that this is not just a snack, it's not, it's not just a, a church fellowship meal, but it's a spiritual transaction. And if you come to that spiritual transaction and you're not clothed in the righteousness of Christ, then you will only eat and drink judgment to yourself. And I would, I would, I would prevent you from that. And so if you don't trust in Christ, don't come to this table, but instead use the time simply to pray and ask the Lord to give you that faith. Ask him to give you confidence. Ask him to save you. Let's take a moment now in prayer to set aside these elements and to consecrate them for the use that God has given them. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he supplies our every need. And that even as we face trial and temptation and suffering and wounding in this life, we know that we stand clean in your sight because of the work of Christ on our behalf. And we also know that of the many ways, of the many ways that you, that you come before us equipping us and encouraging us to continue in the faith, this is chief among them. For here at this table, you nourish your people on the body and blood of Christ. We will feed on him by faith, and he will strengthen us to continue in the faith. We thank you so much for that, and we pray that you would give us faith as we approach the table in whatever, whatever condition we find ourselves, whether we find our faith strong or weak in this moment, let it be firmly planted in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And so, beloved, the bread that we break is our communion with the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as the bread is distributed, please hold on to it and we'll all partake together.
Take, eat, remember, and believe that through Christ you are clean before your heavenly Father. Beloved, the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is our communion with the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd remind you that wine is in the outer ring of each of the trays and grape juice is in the inner rings. Now, beloved, take and drink, knowing that Christ strengthens you to continue in the faith.
Please stand with me as we close by singing together number 94, How Firm a Foundation. Beloved, go trusting that Jesus has reconciled you to your heavenly Father, and go encouraging and exhorting one another to continue in the faith and go with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his grace to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.